Like this. Sí, sí. Okay. I do want this to sit there. Yeah, to, to the center. Let's fill these seats here next to each other. All right. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. And the feather will remain until the end of the conference with me. It's a very <laughs> big honor and, and uh, a permanent reminder of um, what our um, Chief Frank was, was telling us how, how important it is to, to sit in circles and uh, not, not just confrontational. I just tried to do that with my seat. But yeah, maybe, maybe you want to, to simulate a bit of a circle over there as well. <laughs> that way we, 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 we follow that and we enable a bit of discussion. So we have here the very first panel um, of our today's conference with very distinguished speakers. I spoke to each of you before and I was um, explaining to you how important this first panel is to send, uh, to send over here the expectations, right? And to also explain to, to the audience and remember um, why, why we focus here so much on destinations. Destinations are not just the theme of the conference, but there's a logic why we made that the theme, why we made that the focus, why we made that the very first panel, because we have seen as a UN organization specialized in uh, on, on tourism, we, we have seen that tourism policies without any exception nowadays speak about sustainability. It's a strategic objective echoed in each and every national tourism policy. But at the same time, we saw that there's an implementation gap. When we look at the instruments over there made available to implement these policy objectives, there's a gap. And then we see there's a huge gap also in monitoring actually whether we are achieving through our policies these desired objectives. Um, and, and that is why, why we then re realize that it's destinations which are leading very often the implementation. And I have with these panelists over here, a very great pleasure to have different facets of these uh, destination perspectives. And, and the very first question I would like to echo or get an echo from, from you is, um, do, you, do you feel that you are leading the implementation of sustainable policies? And I make that an open question so that the person who feels comfortable to start the conversation <laughs> can out himself or herself. <laughs> I'm Alan. happy to out myself from perfect. Yeah. Please. <laughs> uh, so I'm Ellen Walker Matthews from the Thompson Okanagan Tourism Association in Canada. And I want to recognize Glenn Manzik, who's going to be leading the next panel, because he really started this uh, whole initiative in our region back in 2010. And believe me, no governments were talking about it then, or at least none of the governments in North America were talking about it then, nor were the communities, nor were the provinces. And so we were the outliers. Um, and in through the process of the last 13 years, uh, we've been able to set some some policies or present some policies. We don't set policy, government does, but be able to move the needle to the point where today in the province, we have five destinations that are all certified biosphere with uh, the Responsible Tourism Institute, which we're very proud of. And then we have a commitment program in place right now that is funded by government uh, to be able to bring our stakeholders and our communities on board in, into sustainable practices. So we've seen a real movement, it took 13 years and we were often shunned, but uh, we're seeing that all really change now. Yaitza, si me permites ahora mismo dirigirme en español a ti, tú como ministra ahí de las Canarias, tienes las competencias, además de... Um, para, para gestionar el, uh, elementos del sector donde vosotros veis la necesidad de gestionar a través de, de leyes, pero también podéis incentivar. ¿Qué, qué, ¿Qué sientes o qué puedes compartir con nosotros sobre esa idea? Es, es el nivel de destinos, es el nivel subnacional donde nosotros muchas veces vemos la implementación, adelantando la implementación, ¿es verdad? Sí, Dir, la verdad que me alegra mucho que hayas planteado este panel de discusión y quiero agradecerte que nos hayas invitado a participar porque realmente la práctica nos ha puesto de relieve que los destinos realmente son los verdaderos catalizadores y van a ser los verdaderos catalizadores del cambio 
de la lucha contra el cambio climático, de la descarbonización del sector turístico, nosotros lo hemos implementado así. Cierto es que tenemos que tener un marco europeo, recursos europeos, todos conocemos los Next Generation, también un marco nacional, pero al final en España las competencias están transferidas a las comunidades autónomas, también luego a los cabildos insulares, como en el caso también de Mallorca y las entidades locales, pero sí que es cierto que nosotros, por lo menos desde Turismo de Islas Canarias, hemos podido con acciones concretas y específicas ayudar al sector turístico y esto es importante en esa transición. Al final hay que aterrizarlo, como digo yo, llevarlo a los territorios donde están las administraciones públicas por un lado, donde están también el sector privado por el otro, tanto las grandes empresas como las pymes, micropymes, autónomos y la administración tiene el deber y la obligación, es lo que nosotros queremos hacer y es lo que implementamos desde Islas Canarias, de acompañamiento, de ayudar, de transmitir no solo, solo mero transmisores de dinero, de dinero europeo, que llega de Europa, Estado, Estado, Canarias, adiós. No, nosotros ayudamos a través del asesoramiento y, la y de la publicidad y del acompañamiento a ejecutar proyectos tractores y a ejecutar acciones de sostenibilidad. Tal es así que nosotros en el año eh, pues 2021 ya eh, nos adherimos. Bueno, el año pasado iniciamos en el 2021 una hoja de ruta, estrategia la llamamos Canarias Destino. Empezamos ahí a trabajar hacia el favor de la sostenibilidad y la neutralidad climática, desarrollando políticas siempre ancladas en los marcos europeos y nacionales, pero aterrizándolas en las necesidades verdaderas del destino, de los sectores públicos, del sector privado, qué es lo que se necesita en cada territorio, que probablemente sea diferente en cada uno de los que estamos aquí, pero es muy importante, nosotros realmente somos los que debemos de diseñar esas acciones y esas políticas específicas para que al final, la lucha contra el cambio climático y la neutralidad sea una realidad. Y en paralelo también, en el año 2022, ya pues bueno, como marco mundial, la declaración de Glasgow nos brinda una oportunidad excepcional. Y en Canarias, pues pudimos en octubre del 2022 firmar eh, no solo el sector público, sino eh, cámaras de comercio, los siete cabildos insulares, una nutrida representación del sector privado, adherirse. Y tenemos ahora mismo también pues, un catálogo con 220 medidas con acciones concretas, un catálogo que pueden ser mayores, mejorables, etcétera. También tenemos una oficina de sostenibilidad para mejorar y hacer ese acompañamiento durante la implementación de todas estas medidas, o que surjan dudas o surjan nuevas oportunidades. Y, por supuesto, también pues, contamos con de los Next Generation, importantísimo, recursos financieros. Yeah, so let, let me ask this, this challenge as a destination level of, of sustainability in, in the next round. Maybe I just right now um, follow up on, we, we are different. The context is different of our destinations from destination to destination. And that is why policymakers over there are closer to the real problems. And I wanted to turn to Ronald. Ronald, I, I, I heard you speaking in the, at the conference in, in December in the Canary Islands, uh, where Yaisa was the host, and you, you focused very much on, on the cultural component. And then I discussed with you later on these this very specific challenges Gozo has. Um, also from, and, and that's what I remember from our conversation that you reconnected, you didn't see it just as a product of tourism. You over there you formulated that, that there's something more and where, where you see the connection to tourism. Can you just explain what, what that meant? Yeah, so thank you, Dirk. Uh, but allow me to apply some context before going to, 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 to answer your question. So what is destination branding all about? It's about having an image, it's about having your identity, but after all, um, it's essentially a reputation which is being recurrent from time to time. Now, that means that it is very difficult to change your reputation, and it's very difficult also to develop it, to enrich it, and to enhance it. And we all know that reputations are not built through communication. It can be communicated, your reputation can be communicated, but a reputation, a strong reputation, is not built by communication. So how is a strong reputation built? It's built by garnering experiences and have them tried and tested. So we need the people to be allowed to experience what we are offering and then continue to perpetuate that success. So let's go to Gozo. Um, throughout the years, let's say two, three decades ago, um, the most popular slogan, the most popular tagline was, Gozo, your son and see the summer. <laughs> and Okay, um, what is Gozo? Gozo is not an isolation. Gozo is an island. Gozo is in the Mediterranean Sea. And automatically people would say, listen, that's the product that Gozo has to offer. And instead of trying to change that, what we did was say, listen, that is what the people want. 
So let's go outside and tell the people, we have the sun, we have the beach, and we are directing that message to the people of Europe, which is the most approximate market source that we have, and it's the largest market source that we have, and we know that they have cold winters. So that's how we try to entice them to come over to, come over to Gozo. But in the end, is that sustainable to have a product that even though our climate permits our summer to be extended two months before or two months after, it's still we suffered a lot from seasonality. So what was happening there from an economic point of view, it's not sustainable. Um, for, one, for one instance, for example, you had lots of hotels and restaurants closing down in the winter period. So their employees didn't find it lucrative enough to find stable employment. And you cannot work without the human resources because after all, the human resources are also a product of your country. They can portray your identity. They can portray your image. And um, so that was one of the problems that we were finding. So let's go back forward in time. And government after government in Malta um, managed to tap into a niche that had so much potential for us. For those of you who probably are not aware about Gozo, um, we're a very small island in the Mediterranean, right in the center of the Mediterranean, that throughout the years and, and, and centuries of history that the Mara Nostrum is so, such a protagonist of, um, we witnessed so many fantastic or fascinating or epic historical events in our island because we're practically a stepping stone between North Africa and Europe. And um, our history goes back to around 6,000 years. Um, there are some who say that it goes even further than that and was ended up in a huge controversy on Netflix a couple of months ago, but that's fine. Um, and we decided they'd say, listen, let's continue to develop that product because in the end, it's not only for the tourists, it makes us proud. It's our heritage, it's our cultural heritage. And that brings the people, it brings the stakeholders because you don't do this alone. It brings all the stakeholders on the table and I, I really enjoyed someone else before mentioning that stakeholders, they are part of the inclusive product. And it's not only about the policy, so we can tie this to your first question. Um, it's a mixture of both. You need the government, but you need all the other entities that can contribute, genuinely contribute. Um, so yes, and, and there are a couple of projects that one can mention. I don't want to, to go into too much time, um, too much details of projects, but there were the projects that were um, renovating and restoring, getting back to life a couple of landmarks and sites. As I mentioned, we have... I think, Ronald, we, we can then tackle that mm -hmm. and, um, when, we, when we then focus a bit more on, on regeneration, because that is a second round of questions I would like to launch to, to, to you as a panelist. And with this opening question, I wanted to, to welcome right now the speaker sitting next to you, Peter Susek from Ljubljana. Um, Peter, you, you um, as a destination, uh, unknown to many here in the room, you have um, been over there pushing for a green agenda, uh, Ljubljana, and you, you invented quite, quite a number of things over there. And when we spoke, um, you, you, you triggered some, some new thoughts um, about regenerative tourism. But before we come to that right now, let, let's hear from you right now. Is this, is this level of implementation of policies of implementing initiatives, is that from your experience right now, a level where, uh, where it is properly positioned? Is it the level where, where the interface is uh, with um, the, the different stakeholders and the, the right interface level? Is, is that something you can confirm for Ljubljana? Uh, hello, I'm, uh, first of all, officially to everyone who, who I haven't had the uh, possibility to speak in person yet. Um, well, the obvious answers would be yes, but mine is no, <laughs> because otherwise we wouldn't have this gap <laughs> that you opened with. Um, the, the thing is that we are not the ones who are um, um, introducing policies. We are the ones who are introducing practices that the smart governments would listen to and implement policies, you know? So lead by example, that's uh, what we do. You said that we are pushing the green agenda for years, and I really, really appreciate your observation. However, I would not phrase it that way because we are not pushing the green agenda as per se or as, as such. We are simply introducing the way of living we have been living for years uh, or decades, uh, centuries. Uh, we obviously were just, let's say, smart enough to put it in a uh, proper narrative in time. 
Uh, we, we were also the European Green Capital 2016. We still are in our part of Europe, the only one, like more than 1,000 kilometers away. There is no other European Green Capital. But why am I emphasizing this? Because of the uh, explanation that European Commission um, uh, said it openly when we were uh, held uh, the, the title. They said that we meet, uh, that we did the least amount of, uh, the most amount of changes in the least amount of time for quality of life, but not quality of life for tourism, quality of life of us locals who live there, and uh, uh, consequently also to uh, for tourism, uh, because at the end, um, the locals or the, yeah, the people who live in destinations they can be, they were not, not they can be, they really are the worst critics. However, if they understand the story and if they are in the whole thing together, if they understand tourism per se, they would also be the best ambassadors. And that's what we work on mm. consequently. Very nice, very nice to, to, to hear that. And at the same time, a confirmation of the diversity and diversity of this panel. So, so Ellen and you are sitting somewhere in the same boat when it comes to policy making. Mm -hmm. um, um, but at the same time, you both have made experiences right now that you are a source of inspiration, that you are over there uh, seeing, sensing, interpreting, and then you depend on, on the, 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 the policy level to, to listen properly to you. And um, do, do you feel that this is functioning? Are you, there are some tips for those who are in a similar, in a similar situation over here? How, how can you make yourself hurt in such an environment when you can't rule yourself, but you, you have made the experiences? Great question, Dirk, and a, a, a complicated <laughs> one. And I'm going to start by saying that I think COVID in our situation actually helped us. And it, it's a strange um, thing to say, but we became a tourism resiliency provider at the time, and we changed the model of the entire organization over COVID and became very, very close to our stakeholders, closer than we'd been, I think, probably since the organization was born 50 years ago. We took it upon ourselves, again, through the, through the direction of our leadership to uh, do one-on-one -on -one advisory services with our stakeholders. So, you know, people were drowning in government um, opportunities. They were drowning in the things that were coming at them. They were drowning in the loss of business. And so we called them and, and made ourselves available to have one-on-one -on -one advisory services. What happened there is we came very close to our stakeholders and we understood what was going wrong at government, what was going wrong with policy and be able to communicate that up both provincially and federally. And so our role for the first time was very clear as to where we sat between the stakeholder and the government, and we could help both by what we were hearing. And today we've taken that to a new program called the uh, Sustainable Tourism Network. Uh, the Tourism Sustainability Network, TSN, so you can remember it. Um, and we're taking the exact same approach with sustainability. So we've you know, created this, this open communication with our advisors to industry to be able to say, what do you need to become sustainable? What do you understand about sustainability? What's missing for you? And then communicate that up to government and say, you know, they all want to follow the lead. You're starting to understand what that is. And here's where the gaps are. And so I said to you the other day, we're the boots on the ground, we're the ears that are able to communicate in both directions. And so my advice is the closer you can get to what's really going on with the stakeholders, the better you're be able to provide information up to government. Yaita. Ahora, vosotros tenéis su su le permite de 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 formular leyes. Ahora mismo hemos escuchado de de los de las ponencias de 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 Petra y de de Ellen que que ellos son interlocutores de intereses que que están llamando la atención vosotros sois más privilegiados porque estáis los interlocutores o tú, tú ves ahí un nivel distinto que es interlocutor para vosotros cómo, cómo estáis vos, vosotros viendo vuestra posición privilegiada o desafortunados. No, yo creo que realmente lo que estamos es luchando de forma continua. Es cierto que es importante y que yo creo que tenemos las dos vertientes. Somos interlocutores, es importante estar siempre en un contacto directo con el gobierno nacional, también con la Unión Europea, 
pero bueno, no siempre se llega a los mismos tiempos de las necesidades reales de los territorios, ya las compañeras lo han comentado, el COVID ha sido uno de ellos, y luego por otro lado somos más proactivos porque también tenemos capacidad para legislar. Y por un poco lo que decía Helen, en relación al momento del COVID pudimos ser muy proactivos, fuimos la única comunidad autónoma de España en tener un decreto específico para turistas y poder mantener la actividad turística abierta durante todo el año porque no tenemos estacionalidad, a excepción del mes de confinamiento que se decretó a a nivel estatal. Esto fue posible porque elaboramos una norma en el ámbito de la comunidad autónoma donde es imprescindible y es algo que por lo menos desde el inicio de mi legislatura y hasta ahora mismo creo que es la fórmula de éxito para sacar cualquier iniciativa adelante es que sector público y sector privado vayan de la mano a todos los niveles y nosotros aquí en este caso también consensuamos un, te, un decreto en el que establecíamos, pues en aquel momento, como no teníamos otra opción, pues los test de antígenos, antes de, primero PCR, luego test de antígenos, luego cualquier tipo de test, luego las vacunas que fueran saliendo para poder entrar o salir de los establecimientos alojativos turísticos y por tanto luego ya las aerolíneas y demás pues también trabajaban por otro lado, pero lo que era en el territorio canario accionamos a través de normativa acordada sector público, sector privado, obviamente aprobada en seno de consejos de gobierno y luego posterior y también luego eh, ratificada por el Parlamento de Canarias y después en paralelo un plan de acción específico pues con un call center como comentaba por ejemplo Helen de atención personalizada a cada uno de los turistas regionales, canarios me refiero, peninsulares, internacionales para cualquier duda que tuvieran y además suscribimos un seguro de asistencia por COVID que creo que fue yo creo que el primero en el mundo para que y de a día de hoy pues eh, eso ha tenido muy buen resultado porque teníamos muy claro que la imagen que en ese momento fuéramos a dar del destino iba a ser probablemente nuestra mayor campaña de promoción en el futuro para recuperarlo. Y lo bueno también es que pudimos mantener durante todo ese tiempo pues, un cierto nivel de turismo y estar abiertos a quien pudiera querer venir a Canarias y disfrutar de un turismo seguro. Ellen, uh, I just come back to you because there's a thematic link in, in, in this conversation right now and with an experience you, you have pointed at before, uh, the pandemic, the resilience support you gave to, to um, the tourism sector, but as you told me before, it, it went beyond the tourism sector. So for, for you, the pandemic was an eye opener where the, the infrastructure of a DMO, of a destination management organization as you evolved into, Uh, serviced over there differently, the community, the businesses. Can you just explain right now um, how that happened and what that meant? You pointed at it before, but what that meant right now for your sustainable network, which you are um, keeping active? Yeah, and uh, so to the conversation that you and I had, Dirk, it wasn't just the pure tourism operators that were invited to participate in the resiliency program. If you were affected or if tourism is touched your organization or your business, we really included that in the program. And so we became closer to the communities as a whole, as well as the residents. And I think you spoke about the importance of the residents. We see that as a vital that, again, during the pandemic, we had to make sure, and as all the world did, that residents wanted tourism back and how did they feel about tourism? And so being very close to that sentiment and understanding it and working with it was important. And that meant talking to more than just pure tourism businesses, but really involving uh, the network of businesses that in our region, you know, arguably everybody's in tourism in our region. I mean, there would be a few in the tech sector that maybe don't think so, but I could say that they probably are as well. So really opening up ourselves to being very visible to the industry, to, to industry as a whole, not just the tourism industry. There comes a question right now for everybody on the panel, because uh, actually what we're uh, seeing here right now is, is an interpretation of how tourism how tourism is functioning at destination level and that you have different environments, different possibilities to legislate or to, to incentivize. But at the same time, what we hear here now from each of you, but from different perspectives is, uh, we are not only doing tourism. We are doing here something significantly larger. And, and that, that is something which, which we notice around the world taking more and more often place that tourism is actually gradually moving into a position where it is because of the ability to talk to people, because of the product, terminology product, but it's, it's a human to human interface, um, which we are facilitating, <clears throat> that we are taking on additional roles to support governments whether they are legislating or whether they are just managing and then communicating up to those levels where legislation is taking place. Do you see that? 
Is this something you feel what, what you can observe in, in your destinations? And I leave it right now open to any of you who wish to. I'll, <laughs> go ahead. No, it's okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Talk to you. Um, definitely. I mean, I think we have great examples. Frank being here today is one of those examples from our Indigenous tourism perspective. I mean, when when our regional plan was written in 2012 or launched in 2012, what it talked about was the broad scope <laughs> of what tourism needed to be in our region. Um, and it took on a number of areas, including just working with Indigenous communities as to what they what they thought their role might be in, in advancing the region. But another area that we work in, and that's really come a long way in the last, so I've been with the organization 14 years, we have the odd crisis. And I'm sure many of you can understand that. I won't name what crises those might be, but every once in a while, things of mother nature uh, affect us. And 14 years ago, when we would ask, what should we do? We were told, be quiet, don't talk to media, don't say anything, stand down. This is not a tourism issue. Today, we sit at the table with government, with the emergency management and climate relief people. We talk about what we do with the, with the residents. We talk about what we do with the tourists. We talk about how to communicate and message out through media. So that's a role that we didn't have any role in 14 years ago. And now we're at the table the minute something's happening and we're in conversation to make sure that everybody's protected and, and certainly the reputation of the region is protected. And I think you both spoke about reputational management. It's important. Yeah, well, I think that tourism gives us the impetus to act in a certain way because it's very important for our socioeconomic development. And for example, mentioning the, the local the local residents or local artisans, what we did, and I really enjoyed someone else also mentioned this before when he, he coined the term um, field to fork. Well, it's not necessarily field to fork this thing, but we are creating this association and we managed to do it in terms of this artisan network. Now, we all craved for modernization. We all craved for globalization, but these aspects are creating that sort of challenge to authenticity. It's bringing a new competition. <clears throat> Sometimes the competition is even better for them in, from an economic point of view. And I was watching this movie, um, Denzel Washington was saying, when you pray for rain, you have to deal with the mud. And this is the same thing that was happening. Um, so we had the local produce suffering a lot against foreign, um, foreign uh, trade coming from abroad and that created this competition. So what happened? They were all in isolation. They didn't have a consolidated voice. We created this association, gave them this consolidated voice. And now we're trying to create this Gozo quality label mark because we all know that everybody is now increasingly aware about their consumption, what they are eating, drinking, where it's coming from and how it's produced. And someone else also mentioned it, that they like that authentic product. But even for the, for the people from Gozo, they also want to go back to that product. It was just, just that it was not clear and, and, and easy to get touch on it because nowadays the life is, is, is more hectic. Everybody wants to go to the supermarket and if you see one bottle here and one bottle here, that's one the cheapest you go for the cheapest probably. But now we are creating this sort of network and we're going to create this, this label network, this label quality label, and everybody can determine that that product is actually made in Gozo. The honey, the olive oil, the sun-dried tomatoes. So we're going to help the local production because it needs it a lot. Adrian. I'm trying to frame my thought. I mean, we're all going back to our roots. We're all going to back to our DNA, but the the... Tourism per se was always about proper narrative, about um, uh, telling your own stories. However, somewhere in the process, of, let's say decade back, we managed to throw ourselves out of balance. You know, so and that was our main problem. That's what that's where we went wrong. So right now we are just in brackets, uh, uh, um, going back to 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 the balance. Um, it was supposed it should not happen that we would have this that we would have to have this type of summits to talk about how to get back of balance and what the uh, uh, importance of life or I don't know the importance of indigenous uh, people respect for them respect for locals we should not be talking about we should be um, growing that organically since ever but we haven't so now we are here thank God we're talking about it but it's just about uh, going back to balance and balance the economical pillar, which threw us off the balance, 
together with environmental, which we managed to scrub in the process uh, along with the first one, and of course with our self-cultural and and uh, social uh, uh, pillar. That that's what we are basically doing now. It hasn't really changed in the process. We just managed to throw ourselves out of balance. <laughs> Um, Peter, let, let me ask you right now to to because you said how, how to frame that, and and I remember from our previous conversation then on 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 that um, that you made over there very specific experiences right now where um you 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 felt then you offer the tourism uh, management infrastructure you have in Ljubljana in place, and and you you create actually over there completely different benefits right now, uh, which are not in the first place tourism products. Uh, how how did that how did this happen and how how can you frame in this context right now the role of the DMO? I'll, uh, I'll try to go just in two sentences, quite a few steps back. Um, you have to have certain elements to create this type of stories, not only ours, but also some other destinations that made uh, their own approach but was successful. You have to have a um, people with vision specifically governments with vision, uh, with passion, but that's not enough. Uh, you have to have patience, that's a big one, and a very important and a very tough one. And the fourth one, which is really, 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 really important <clears throat> is to have balls, to have courage to implement everything. Because what we've heard several times today, changes hurt, we are resistant towards them. So what uh, happened in Ljubljana a uh, decade and a half, 16 years ago was, that the mayor who was uh, back then freshly elected is still the mayor. So he must be doing something right, even though he's constantly changing the city and uh, uh, making um, uh, disruption in uh, among the locals. So uh, his vision back then was to completely close the city center for traffic, like completely. Not even the people who live there are allowed to go in with the with the uh, car. So people went naturally ballistic. I mean, it was it was craziness through media, initiative groups, uh, um, locals resisting. So he would patiently talk to all the small groups of people, uh, eventually win them over. But however, we completely closed the city center for traffic. The fear was that the life will die out. It happened completely opposite. We got, we, as even as a DMO, you asked me about uh, our, uh, us as DMO, we got new venues like streets, um, uh, uh, squares, to put the um, our events there. The um, uh, people were not afraid of passing cars, passing uh, buses, so they got loosened up. They, they, they came with their families, children to the city center to have strolls. Then restaurants and bars understood this process uh, very quickly. They put their bars outside. So quickly the life emerged and small businesses came back to the city center. And that's when this whole process starts. That at, at the end, we're gonna talk about the regenerative tourism. And this is also part of what, uh, what we did with our uh, craftsmen. How did we implement that into tourism offer? But we implement everything into tourism offer because it's not what we do for business. It's the proper narrative of how we live like uh, we share them the the uh, waste management system uh, center that we have uh we we tell to locals and to other people who's interested what's going on there and how the compost is being produced there for locals to take it to grow in their own gardens veggies or whatever they do we tell locals but also visitors that uh, we wash the streets with uh rainwater we even make have this sustainable tour uh, you know, in this type of tours, we don't only teach the waiters and the owners of rest of bars and restaurants to uh, know what the dish is made of on the plate, mm -hmm. and that it's uh, from farm to table and all this and all that, which 99.9% of destinations uh, know now how to tell, but they know the uh, what it derives from the dish, where the name comes from, why is it the old Ljubljana dish, not only Slovenia dish. These types of things that interest locals first, and then also, of course, if to foreigners, everything exciting to locals, not. So that's what we, we, we started to think of. And that's how we started to build the tourism offer. Everything derives from that, how we live and what is our DNA. And that's a tough one to, um, to figure out. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for these very first 
round of, of um, trying trying to to frame the role of destinations and what what they mean for us in in terms of um, interfacing and helping the right policy development. Right now, I want before we go into then. Um, the announced uh, f a form of regenerative tourism. I want to, to, to first um, and listen from you again, which are um, sustainability challenges just in, in a destination perspective, which you feel where, where tourism has to take a lead in the destination, although they not necessarily might be a, a sustainability challenge from a tourism perspective, but where, where you think tourism Tourism, depending on how large or small tourism is in the destination or what the product is or not, what, 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 wh why would you say that the tourism authorities or the, 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 the staff which is dealing basically with tourism has to lead this discussion and uh, explaining over there some, some of the processes in your destinations uh, in a very practical manner, how you push sustainability, which is actually beneficial for uh, an entire destination for everyone who, who is living over there. Who wants to volunteer for that? Yes. Guys. Sí, perdón. No. <laughs> Perfecto. Sí, sí. Bueno, en Canarias, estaba escuchando a, a los compañeros, eh, nosotros somos muy conscientes de que somos una potencia industria, in, una, una industria turística potente, que tenemos un liderazgo lo bueno de todo esto es que la población, que es importante porque también lo comentaban los ponentes, siente el turismo como una verdadera fuente de riqueza y la forma que tenemos en vivir, de vivir. De hecho, eh, es la que ha hecho que Canarias avance. Supone más del 35% del Producto Interior Bruto, más del 40% del empleo. Sabemos el efecto tractor que tiene sobre el resto de la economía en Canarias y sabemos lo que pasa cuando no hay turismo. Lo vivimos con el cero turístico. Con lo cual que todo eso lo tenemos muy arraigado y existen estudios de las dos universidades públicas de Canarias en las que el porcentaje de satisfacción de los canarios, del residente, con el turismo es enorme, saben que el turismo es útil para su vida y quieren que lo siga siendo y es favorable. Ahora bien, Canarias, cierto es, tiene un 40% del territorio protegido, tiene más de un 46,5% de suelo rústico no urbanizable, eh, cerca del 4% es de uso turístico, es decir, estamos muy protegidos, tenemos junto con Baleares, si mal no recuerdo, el ordenamiento jurídico urbanístico más complejo de toda España, precisamente porque sabemos que tenemos que proteger pues, nuestro territorio. Tradicionalmente hemos venido siendo pues, observados, demandados como turismo de sol y playa, somos mucho más que eso, pero también se nos conoce como el mejor destino, con el mejor clima del mundo, de ahí no, que no existe estacionalidad y se puede venir a Canarias con unos recursos naturales y unas temperaturas envidiables durante todo el año, pero esto está en peligro, el éxito del turismo, si no tomamos medidas para la lucha contra el cambio climático. Y eso lo sabe la población, lo sabemos desde el gobierno, lo sabe el sector privado, y por eso estamos implementando acciones precisamente pues, para no desaparecer, porque el turismo es sostenible, tiene que ser sostenible sí o sí. Y me gustaría compartir con ustedes un proyecto pues, eh, muy singular que se llama, turismo, a, a efectos del turismo regenerativo, eh, que se llama Ecoarias, Mar de Todo. Es un proyecto transversal, creo que también ahí es importante, donde el liderazgo creo que debe de surgir, si no surge de la parte privada o de la población, de la sociedad local, pues también de, la, de, de, las, de las administraciones, en este caso ha surgido de la, de la consejería, del gobierno, y consiste en seleccionar áreas del litoral canario protegidas y que se van a consensuar junto con, pues tenemos 18 técnicos y más de 300 personas voluntarias de las Islas Canarias que quieren preservar ese entorno, ese litoral, recuperarlo, regenerarlo, también mostrarlo, ¿no?, como una esencia de nuestro valor también a nivel turístico, de nuestra idiosincrasia, y esto es importante porque forma parte de acciones regenerativas que cuentan con financiación pública, con acción y apoyo institucional, pero que se extiende hacia toda la población local, apoyados por técnicos, y luego pues todo esto unido luego al turismo pesquero, al turismo marinero, a la cadena de valor gastronómica, todo eso lo tenemos muy claro en Canarias, y desde luego que lo que tenemos claro es que para que esto siga así, siga evolucionando y haya presente y futuro, 
tenemos que luchar contra el cambio climático con otras medidas, pues bueno, como el Master Plan de Acción, que si luego tenemos oportunidad lo comentamos, pero con acciones específicas para que el sector público y privado alcance la neutralidad climática y seamos sostenibles y podamos vivir del turismo, porque al fin y al cabo, creo, y en Canarias creemos, el turismo es la industria de la felicidad, pero también es la industria de las personas. Y las personas si están felices con la actividad que se realiza, como es el caso de Canarias, al final lo van a transmitir y son los mejores embajadores. Con lo cual, que yo creo que ese es el camino hacia el que, bueno, por lo menos en Canarias, hemos tenido muy buenos resultados, así lo sentimos, y yo espero que también pues, en los otros destinos les podamos en ese sentido colaborar y ayudar y también aprender de ellos. Thank you very much. Who wants to come next? Uh, <laughs> well, certainly, I, I was listening through there, so I think I picked up most of what you were saying, Patrick. Um, from a sustainability perspective, certainly during COVID, we saw some of our achievements in extending our, se our seasonality. We are not all year round summer. And actually what we try to promote is the fact that we have great four season destination. We were doing very, very well with that prior to 2020. And then with different rules and regulations and the way our province and our region opened up, we saw that, that huge pressure put back onto those summer sun and fun months. And so our work right now is really in going back to our, our goals and objectives of bringing people in, you know, not necessarily at 12 months of the year, which may be unrealistic, but certainly we can do a great job around 210 days of the year. And we're starting to see that come back. But a lot of that pressure was simply because of of regulations. I mean, we have some sustainability issues that I'm sure everyone does have around the world, staff shortages, which are, are causing us incredible issue, um, housing issues for those staff. We're seeing immigration. Of course, immigration means that people need rental accommodation. We don't have it. We don't have it at affordable levels. So those are all topics that we're talking about regularly with, with local government and provincial governments as well as business operators and how they might come up with private solutions to some of these real challenges, because those are long-term issues that if we don't have the people to service the, the tourist or the resident, we can't have that, that tourist product happen. So that's a really big one for us. And then accessibility, uh, both in terms of building out accessible products for those with, with mobility challenges, but also access to our region. Um, we are the interior of British Columbia. We're a four hour drive from Vancouver, which, um, probably most of you know is on the coast of British Columbia, a beautiful area, but we are largely accessed internationally by flights. And so again, with the challenges around air and air right now in Canada is expensive, um, we're seeing a reduction in actual access. So we have a number of things that we're working on to, to ensure that tourism can be maintained uh, for the long term. Yeah, I completely concur with, with the previous speakers and, and probably also want, want to add on something um, that the minister was saying is that we talk about awareness that can be a problem, um, a challenge in order to curb sustainable development or climate challenges, uh, the problems that come with that. But I don't think it's awareness. Um, I think we've been hearing somebody mentioned the Brundtland report since 1987. How can that be uh, an awareness problem? So I don't believe in that. But then I also heard somebody else saying that it's the people that you have to push and, 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 and push the people to change. And sometimes governments try that, and, and, and probably the easy solution is throwing money at the problem. <clears throat> and sometimes that doesn't work. And then when you draw back the lines, you say, listen, we've, we've had that expenditure, and the results weren't those that were wished. And then if one thing comes to another, and, and you see priority shifting. Now, this does not necessarily have to be for one government or the other, but I think it can, can be um, mentioned in a lot of different political fora. As for seasonality, um, something that I wanted to mention before, but I didn't, I didn't mention it, was that the feel-good factor that we have created thanks to our cultural strategy is that we do not have as much as restaurants and hotels closing down. So we have seen a positive change in that in terms of enhancing the experiential factor. Now you can go to a beach here and there, and there's a practical similar experience but everybody has his own culture, everybody has his own identity. And that's what helps to create different experiences and what helps to bring people into different segments of the year. And that's what we needed. We're not there yet. We can, there's still um, other things that we can do to improve, but perpetuating success is the first step. If one thing's work, then the other thing can, can most probably work again and you keep on going. Well, no, thank you very much. And, and Pedro, the, and gi giving you now the possibility before I prepare my panelists already for two more questions. Um, 
through which we then want to, to close the link. Petra? What is the biggest challenge yeah. from my perspective, from our perspective? Well, the biggest challenge is obvious uh, uh, is to bring everyone in the picture. That's the biggest challenge. Uh, and you have to have really, like I said before, patience. You just need to talk to all the stakeholders constantly. Most of the time, the same thing over and over and over again, because eventually they will hear it. But we, as, as a role of destination management, whatever uh, uh, form they are in, public, private, uh, mixed, uh, 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 empowered, not empowered, uh, we are the ones who, uh, who have this power to move people, to uh, take people into actions. Uh, just, again, in brackets, the narrative needs to be uh, the mm -hmm. proper one. Look, I've been born in uh, uh, in completely other worlds, not um, way before pandemic, obviously. However, it's, I've been born in different century, different country, different system. I was, Slovenia used to be part of Yugoslavia, uh, which was socialistic system. People were not environmental, environmental consciousness. What the heck is, uh, you know, separation of waste? No one knew about it. Now we have the biggest separation uh, uh, percentage in Europe for reuse. Uh, we, we, um, we have so many sustainable practices and uh, even the kids in, 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 in kindergartens are literally pushing their parents towards it. So it can be done in less than one generation. That's my point. <laughs> Just with the really, really strong narrative and being persistent with it. That's how we've done. Right now, what we are doing since COVID times is, or pre, just before COVID times, was tourism, you know, became like this negative thing everywhere. Why don't we massively talk about positive things to tourism? But to whom, again, first? To locals. So we did the, the, the whole campaign to Ljubljana people only. What do we who live there benefit from atmosphere and money that tourists are bringing to us. No one really from locals knew that pump tracks mm -hmm. where they are cycling with their children are done or the other infrastructure, uh, docks for Ljubljana, river boats, which is massively used by locals. They would not be there if there would no be, uh, not be tourists with their money because we are channeling that money into infrastructure. We're putting, like I said before, events on the streets and, uh, and, and, and um, uh, squares out of the money that tourists bring us through their tourism tax. And last but certainly not least, they finally started to understand their family um, uh, own, uh, their family or their friends have job directly or even indirectly through that because we made the whole campaign through that. Mm -hmm. And in COVID times, that's the most important thing, in COVID times where everyone went crazy in all sorts of senses uh, through social media, even though the reach was much more than just Ljubljana people, it was the whole Slovenia people, not one single negative comment was made out of the anonymous people on social media, not one. And we're really proud of that. But I, I, I want to echo what I heard right now from you, from Ronald, uh, here in, during the panel discussion where you said communication is, is an important part. Um, but at the same time, it's not the only part. Um, and many of the things you mentioned, all of you, um, had already uh, components of regeneration, uh, of uh, the regenerative function tourism can have, which we are talking right now about in, in uh, communication terms. This might sound new, but many of the things you mentioned and you're doing in good, uh, in good practices already um, are having the characteristics of regenerative tourism for society, not only for nature, for um, the, 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 the larger than the tourism perspective in the destination. So that the tourism DMO, which we want to discuss here today, representing the management function of a destination actually is carrying on functions beyond that. Now, we have launched last year together with WTTC and SHA the uh, nature for uh, and the nature of uh, no the net positive for nature alliance. We we hear right now uh, net positive commitments more and more coming forward from the industry, from the public sector, from the different stakeholders. That is definitely right now a support to make the argument that tourism is addressing also in positive terms. 
uh, externalities, which before through many of the and during the sustainability initiatives, we just tried to limit the negative external externalities. But right now, we, we feel that this is the time when the tourism sector is ready, when many of the tourism sector's stakeholders are ready to make a larger commitment. Uh, do you feel it's the time? Is it the time for the tourism sector right now to make this commitment? Do you feel ready to use that statement? Do you feel that this is helping you right now for something larger? So Dirk, 100%. Yeah, uh, sorry. <laughs> All right. um, I think I think our, our stakeholders have come out of the pandemic understanding that, that and residents understanding the value of tourism. I think we've never been understood as, as much as we have been now. I think that people understand climate change better than they have ever have, and they, they actually believe it's happening and that everyone has a role to play. Um, and I think that we're so well positioned right now to take tourism to the next level, to be the manager of the, of the destination, to help, help our governments manage through these issues. And again, we are the boots on the ground. We have that connection and we know that the stakeholders need direction and they're asking for direction, at least in our situation. We hear it, we get the calls. We have people saying, I wanna do something. Where do I start? I don't wanna greenwash. I may not have a lot of money. I may have a little money. I want to plan. And that's what are the role that we're trying to take on is helping to guide them um, hand by hand and, take, and make that plan. Yeah, but, well, I think that tourism can be the catalyst to change and, and taking it from a Gosetan perspective, again, we are a very small island with 30,000 people. The very simple or easiest thing that we can say is that we are so small, our little things are not contributing to the problems of the world. But um, tourism can help us, help us differentiate our way of thinking, because if we want to remain um, a sustainable destination, a destination can, that can offer an experience, a destination that we want people to come and enjoy in, we have to act um, nonetheless if we think that we are not contributing a problem to the world because we are too small. So I think that tourism will play, is playing, has played, and will continue to play um, an important role in our quest to continue changing and becoming more sustainable year after year. That's a... Pues nosotros desde luego que, que consideramos que, que el turismo eh, y los agentes del turismo, eh, hablo sector público, sector privado, y en este caso la sociedad canaria, está preparada para, la, para los, los pasos que realmente se requieren para la sostenibilidad. Tenemos claro que el turismo es un elemento transformador de sociedades. Nosotros en el pasado lo vivimos como archipiélago, pasamos de eh, una actividad agraria, por así decirlo, para de, de cómo podíamos sobrevivir, a gracias al, al desarrollo del turismo en Canarias, hemos podido ir a las universidades de una forma más democrática, se ha democratizado el acceso a la educación, a muchos más servicios, a salir incluso del propio archipiélago para mejorar nuestros conocimientos, mejorar nuestras experiencias laborales, y eso gracias al principal motor económico que tenemos en las islas, que es el turismo y el efecto tractor. Y ahora mismo nosotros somos muy conscientes de que el turismo tiene que ser sostenible sí o sí. Y todos nuestros partners públicos y privados lo son eh, per perfectamente conscientes a todos los niveles, a nivel local, regional, nacional, internacional. Y no lo implementan como una medida de marketing, es una cuestión ya de responsabilidad propia con los destinos, con la vida, con el mundo que tenemos y con el mundo que queremos dejar para las generaciones futuras, porque si no, esto se acaba. Lo tenemos claro, lo vimos, vimos ya en el COVID, cómo el turismo paralizó el mundo entero y en ello la industria turística. Y de eso tenemos que pues, tomar conciencia y accionar. Y precisamente durante todo este tiempo hemos estado trabajando en Canarias. En el año 2021 cerramos Canarias Destino, que es la hoja de ruta estratégica. Lo hicimos con el sector privado también, de la mano de la, de la consejería también. ¿Por qué? Porque queríamos establecer una ruta estratégica que nos hiciera un destino más resiliente, más sostenible, que pudiera generar efecto de valor tractor del turismo hacia el resto de actividades uh -huh. económicas y, ojo, de lucha contra el cambio climático. Como consecuencia de esa hoja de ruta, la declaración de Glasgow nos brindó una oportunidad maravillosa en el año 2022 y nos adherimos sector público y sector privado con un plan específico, con herramientas específicas, medibles. Es importante medir. El sector público, el sector privado tiene clarísimo que es importante medir, compensar y reducir la huella de carbono. Y para ello, pues tenemos una aplicación digital gratuita para todo el sector que quiera, que quiera acceder. Hicimos un proyecto piloto para medir la huella de carbono, cómo poder reducirla, compensarla. Por otro lado, tenemos un catálogo de 220 medidas con lo mismo. También estableciendo la dificultad de cada una de implementación a nivel de coste, de tecnología, etcétera. Tenemos 170 millones de los fondos Next Generation 
no es fácil ejecutarlos porque son fondos europeos con unos requisitos, pero están canalizados para entidades públicas y privadas a favor de la neutralidad climática y de la lucha contra el cambio climático. Esta oficina de acompañamiento, importantísima, porque si no, pues conseguimos esa unidad de acción que hemos venido teniendo por lo menos desde el año 2019, también tenemos que seguir manteniéndola en esta lucha ¿no? eh, por mantener, ser un destino sostenible, eh, pues creo que, yo creo que por lo menos en Canarias eh, somos muy conscientes, estamos muy preparados, nuestros stakeholders, nuestros partners también lo son y estamos trabajando constantemente con ellos y yo creo que esa es la clave del futuro del turismo en el mundo. <risa> Yes, we definitely are um, part of something bigger. No, no uh, question about it. Um, tourism is actually bringing the now nowadays is actually um, uh, making people aware of cultural differences, and they uh, and and they're it, it's building respect, and that's what we need in all this, uh, the the destinations because. Um, we would in in other circumstances if you would everything grow more naturally more organically more listening to each other we would not be talking about endangered um indigenous tourism or 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 um uh, societies or even uh, i don't know female uh, uh, uh tourism and how to empower fem uh, uh, female in tourism it's we should not be talking about it and yet here we are so today through tourism and through proper narrative and i cannot emphasize enough uh the term proper two terms proper narrative uh we are building respect and that we that is something that we really really need that because through that we are building the pride in people in in basically everyone most importantly pride of people everywhere in the world for their own legacy not interest in some other answers or not only interest in some uh, some else's uh, cultural legacy when they travel and only during the travel however in our own legacy and pride of our own legacy and this is what we right now are participating on and we are as my personal very strong opinion we're finally on the right track uh to 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 really do that uh, organically and along with that i don't know we take care also of survival of uh, uh, um, ancient crafts uh, people who are still doing uh, that you know there are so many layers now put into that and so um many proper emphasizing coming out of it that people are much more conscious about the beauty of the world in general however philosophical that sounds but it's really not in its core than it we used to be less than a decade ago Pedro, dear panelists I, I thank you very much for for this um re reflection right now in a very limited time about the role of destinations that's what we wanted to provoke in the very first panel uh, a discussion on uh, what is happening at the destination level? What what do you feel is your responsibility? What are your individual experiences carrying out this task of moving sustainability for the tourism sector together with the different stakeholders uh, ahead? We have seen here a different range of, of uh, frameworks in which you are interacting and the challenges, um, but at the same time, and Petra, I echo what I heard from you at the beginning, um, you are leading and and when 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 you are leading, and I know that from each of you uh, through the individual conversations we had, when you are leading, you are facing a lot of headwinds, <laughs> and these headwinds sometimes can be really mean, mm -hmm. and they can require over there what you mentioned before that you get up again after um, a wave and winds. And uh, Chief Frank was speaking also in in one of his um, presentations about wind and the the way how wind is shaping and in influencing us. And, and these, these winds, these daily winds might disturb us very much. And they make us also feel that we are quite lonely uh, when we are managing destinations ahead of others, ahead of the frameworks which are surrounding us. When we can't look up, when we are actually together trying to find over there solutions, best practices and um, leading through the tourism sector uh, transformation, transformation of destinations that we take on this responsibility. When we, and that is, uh, I wanted to formulate that as a question, but in the end of fairness, I thought I'm just summarizing your thoughts here as the moderator. 
and conclude with what was our original idea when uh, when we convened you here in Mallorca with the great support of um, Mallorca um, on this very specific topic. We wanted to create a forum where destinations can the entire focus, where the discussions of the problems destinations are facing are getting the entire focus, where we as the system of the United Nations recognize that destinations aren't doing an extraordinary job in implementing sustainability, where we know that they have to interface and to solve problems, which others then later on will benefit from. But at the same time, we wanted to give you a forum to connect, to present your thoughts, to present your problems, to present over there the achievements so that you get, again, confirmation, so that you can go back into the destinations and make reference to a conference which we organized here. And that you can say, I found myself over there in a community where there was for two days a discussion taking place on our issues so that we actually get confirmation that our approach, despite of the headwinds, is the right one, and that we continue leading. We wanted to thank you all for having made this trip, this journey here to Mallorca, to having exposed in the first panel the thoughts on the role of destinations as a catalyst for sustainable and regenerative tourism. I thank you all very much, and I thank you for your Nice and quiet attention. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Derek, very much. Thank you. Derek. Thank you. Thank you, sir.